All right, everyone. So my portion of this webinar is intro to green graphic design, uh, which is designed to make a difference. So basically, I own a small studio called Little Fox Design, and we really focus on designing sustainable, environmentally friendly uh, brands and collateral, so business cards, print design, et cetera, for my clients. We really try and have a research focused approach so that we're leaving a minimal impact for both people on the planet and also ecosystems. And so this is really important to me because I was really struggling for a long time with my design business on where I should, you know, how I could actually implement the values that I hold in terms of sustainability and environmental awareness into the, the graphic design space. And it took a long time for me to really realize that I could integrate what I cared so much about the environment um, and also my design work together and create a studio that really uh, was a lot of fun for me to um, so basically, I've spent the last year and a half really researching sustainable design practices and understanding my role as a designer in terms of forestry um, and climate crisis and how the design that I create impacts that. So when I was a younger designer, I sort of thought that this was my entire role in terms of the design process. So I would get a client request, I would do some design, I would send it to the printer, and the client and the printer, maybe me, would make some choices about the printing, and then there would be an end result. I have now realized that this, while still very simplified, is actually more what I have control over um, from a designer from a designer perspective. So basically, this means that I get a client request, um, and then it's my job to consider the kinds of design that I'm doing for them. So I need to consider natural resource responsibility, forestry practices, paper manufacturing, transportation. Um, I also need to consider the materials being used print shop protocols, different print specifications for design and life cycle responsibility. So we're gonna go a little bit more into each of these different things as we go through the presentation. So the framework that I like to apply for a lot of my work is questions of harm. So a lot of people, um, especially a lot of designers are always asking the question of like, what problem are we trying to solve? And yeah, see, someone else just joined. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry for, for uh, someone who's trying to join. So um, questions of harm. So basically, what kind of problems are we solving, but also what kinds of problems are we contributing to? So basically, um, you know, as designers, we are making all these choices uh, intentionally or not about the supply chains, about the materials that we print on, and what kinds of problems are we actually contributing to, and what kinds of decisions can we make that are uh, more appropriate for our planet? So I'm not going to lie to you guys. Design isn't going to save the world, uh, but it's our, it is our responsibility as designers to try and make a difference. So basically, design isn't going to create a low carbon future where grassroots like uh, campaigns are successful and you know we have a government that really, really cares about the environment. But it is going to help make a difference and help start to build a future that's better for everyone and start to build a future that has a lower impact for everyone. So basically, by putting in green design practices now, while it won't necessarily save us from climate crisis in its own, it is going to work towards a greener future that is going to be uh, mandatory, hopefully, uh, in the next 10, 20 years, uh, based on, you know, climate crisis and global warming and the kinds of shifts that are going to need to be happening at an industry level. So these design practices are really going to be working towards a more just world and a world that is safe and uh, you know, accessible for everyone. So I think something that we really need to consider as designers is that the physical designs and materials that you create have a life before you create them and have a life after you create them. So basically, yes, you are uh, creating on paper and you know, you're know you talking with the printer and that may be your first interaction with the kind of material that you're choosing. But the paper came from a paper mill somewhere and the paper mill got that mulch from like a logging uh, camp somewhere. And so we do need to consider the supply chains for everything that we create and make sure that you know the forest was logged responsibly, the, the mill isn't creating um, excess pollution or like dumping toxic waste and that the paper was created in a responsible way. And then after we create it, we have like some control over our responsibility for what happens to that product. So basically, we have to consider the fact that 
most of what we create actually ends up in landfill. And that really sucks, but it's true. Most business cards, most promotional materials, it's just going, maybe some of it's recycled, but most of it ends up in landfill. So I think we need to be aware of this and working towards ways where we can create designs that are more recyclable and are more, um, that are designed basically for an end state that is beneficial for the planet. So every time you choose to put a coating on your paper or a um, piece of plastic, like you design something for plastic, sometimes it's unavoidable, but I think it's important to understand that this is going to end up in landfill or basically just become eternal litter and, you know, break down into microplastics if it's got a plastic component. So I really want to move into talking about some of the different kinds of impacts that our design work can have. And this bit's going to be a little bit depressing. Uh, we are going to move into, you know, solution spaces for this and how you can make a difference at the end. So don't worry. So basically ecosystem impact is considering the the impact of forestry and understanding that unsustainable forestry logs old growth forests and damages vulnerable ecosystems that are crucial for the health of our planet. So this can apply to the Amazon rainforest, this can apply to old growth forests in British Columbia and different ecosystems across the planet. We need to be careful about the materials that we're choosing and ensuring that what the design uh, materials that we're choosing actually were ethically uh, and responsibly produced. So this also includes the fact that our inks that we print on are made from petroleum products and some things like metallics and foils actually uh, contain heavy metals that when they end up in landfill can leach into groundwater supplies. This also um, uh, considers uh, so laminates on cards. So basically um, laminates, soft touch mat coatings, all of those uh, spot UV coatings those all have plasticizers so in them. So that basically means the formula contains plastic. So what this means is that the paper can no longer be recycled and um, it's eventually going to break down into microplastics that are gonna damage ocean environments uh, as well as ourselves. So printing impact is really important too. So this is where we sort of have to con consider uh, paper mill policies and whether or not they are dumping uh, toxic water into communities uh, especially more vulnerable communities, uh, such as Black and Latino communities and Indigenous communities. So this is really important to consider because some of the main printing um, mills, or sorry, paper mills actually do regularly and routinely dump toxic uh, wastewater into vulnerable communities and ruin ecosystems, and they just pay the fine. Uh, so a really good example of this is Domtar Paper Company. They have uh, many lines of different sustainable papers that are pretty much industry standard in some parts in terms of responsible paper. However, the unfortunate truth is that their mills themselves are not at all responsible. Um, and in fact, at one mill site, they had to pay $2 million to clean up their environmental pollutions because they did such a bad job of running their own mill. And we need to consider human impact. So basically what this means is that potentially um, you know, the designs that we create can hurt actual people. So if you're choosing um, to create something with plastics, you need to understand where those plastics came from. And I'm not trying to be preachy here or say that we never need to use plastics or that you're never going to be able to use plastics again with a client. Um, but I think it's just important to, about understanding impact and trying to make better choices when possible. Um, but basically, uh, to go back to the plastics, they are created um, in chemical plants that are usually near black communities in the states um, and indigenous communities and these communities experience extremely high rates of cancer and rare diseases and miscarriages and stuff so basically um, in the states and at, well in North America really because it's in Canada too if you live in a community that's near these chemical plants and these plastic plants your rate of getting cancer is 50 times higher than anywhere else in the world so this is really unfortunate um, and we just should be aware that the choices that we make do impact people. So this is also about ensuring that, you know, the, the workers for the forestry and the print shops and the paper are well paid for. Do they have unions, et cetera? Um, the truth is, is that only one to two, one to two percent of plastics are actually recycled at all across the, the entire world. And a lot of the plastic burden is actually shipped off to the global south. Like it used to be a lot of China. But now a lot of it goes to the Philippines and stuff. And 
what this means is that there are people like literally living in plastic. Um, and it is, of course, extremely detrimental to their health. Um, and so we need to be aware, especially for us who are in North America, that our burden for choosing to design on certain materials, um, we are partially responsible for what happens to that. Obviously, there's big corporations and tiers of impact. But I think like it's important to know that if you can convince a client not to use plastic or to use a different type of plastic, like backyard compostable, um, just by explaining the problem to them, then we have a lot of power to change these kinds of things. So I think the main takeaway here is that we really just need to be aware of the kinds of systems that we're working with as designers and the kinds of things that we can have impact for. So we need to be supporting companies that are making better choices with their paper production, with their mills, with their printing companies, um, with the plastic creation, so that we're not intentionally or unintentionally contributing to the continued violation of different human rights crimes across the, across the entire planet. So all of that was fucking depressing. Uh, so this is the part where how can we actually make a difference? Um, so my main takeaway here is that we really need to research and understand these problems. Um, as designers, we do have incredible power when we're working with clients and we're working with printers to specify things and you know have conversations about what the best material is and what kind of different options there are. We don't have to automatically go with the default that is always going to be not environmentally friendly. Um, so the default almost always will be the cheapest option for the client, and sometimes it's worth spending a little bit more money or researching a different option that's the same cost to make a better difference. Um, just checking my notes. So basically, we have a choice in our work for the level of responsibility we want to take for each, each, part, each portion of the design process. So here's where we get to some actionable tips. Um, so basically, for materials and supply chains, you want to be considering and favoring 100% recycled post-consumer waste paper. You want to be looking for paper stocks that are made from renewable energy. You want to be considering alternate materials. So maybe instead of choosing a traditional tree fiber paper, maybe you want to consider hemp or recycled cotton or straw. These are really sort of up-and-coming paper types that are quite uh, common to get a hold of these days, especially hemp. And so sometimes it's worth just exploring different options and reducing your carbon footprint that way. Another option you can do here is researching the supply chain. So really looking into the different paper mills. Do they have any Environmental Protection Act violations? That kind of thing. You're also going to want to look for uh, credible forestry certifications. So that's stuff like the Agent Forest Alliance or the Forest Stewardship Council. So these ensure that the uh, supply chains for the forestry, at least, are ethical and beneficial and support both the workers, indigenous people, and um, the, the uh, ecosystems and biodiversity. In terms of printing and method for printing, so this is where you actually um, have more of a tangible impact because you can have conversations with real people about what you can do to change things. So try to source as local as possible. Try to print on plant-based uh, plant inks, such as soy inks. Um, you can ask your local printer about different sustainable practices and what kinds of things they do in-house in terms of sustainability. Um, try, to print, try to avoid printing solid color backgrounds and maybe opt for a paper stock that is dyed that color instead. You can avoid using metallics and foils because those means the paper can't be recycled um, and it is going to end up in landfill. And again, with the heavy metal issue with the metallics and foils, it's not really good for the environment. You can also avoid laminates, soft touch matte coatings, spot UV, and um, other such water-based um, coatings that put a shiny layer on your paper. This is incredibly difficult to recycle, and um, it also can break down into microplastics as it ages. Um, you can also avoid printing with bleeds um, because this uh, basically, when you print with a bleed, there's ink that gets chopped off uh, of the paper and um, is extra ink wastage. And finally, for life cycle, you should consider, um, especially in terms of plastics, um, what kinds of plastics are you using? Are they backyard compostable or are they bioplastics that need a very specific uh, industrial facility to break down in that's really going to um, hinder their chances of being recycled? You can also research the actual uh, recycling rates of the material that you're using. So maybe it technically is industry recyclable 
But if there's only several, like two facilities across your country that can actually recycle the product, is it, is it going to end up in those facilities? Probably unlikely. Um, so we basically just need to be considering that also consumers um, that are going to be the ones ending up with the things that we create, they are lazy. Um, people don't sort recycling, people don't wash out containers and not even everyone recycles paper. So municipals have 30% up 30% of the landfill um, is paper. So we basically need to be accounting for um, the lowest common denominator in terms of recyclability and ensuring that we're designing for as easy a process as possible for that to be recycled because we can't rely on consumers actually taking a product home, unwrapping the packaging and then knowing what to do with it. So an important question to ask is, this piece that I'm creating, is it going to break down um, and end up in landfill? Is it going to be recycled or um, will it break down naturally on its own? So, you know, if it ends up in the ocean or just like eternal rubbish somewhere, is that going to break down into planet, planet safe um, and people safe materials? Um, Cause that's a really interesting question especially in terms of plastics. So that's basically my short little intro. Um, in terms of green design. And I have more information available. So basically, um, these are my two calls to action for you guys, my two little bonus things. There's a green graphic design course um, that's going to go into like crazy detail for all of this stuff and more. Um, how to talk to clients, technical tips, how to do research, how to understand resource extraction, etc. So that's going to be launched in August. Um, you can sign up to the waitlist at this little tiny link that I'll also paste in the chat. Um, and you're basically just going to get like the first information when I actually launch the course. Um, there's no obligation to sign up for the course just because you're on the wait list. Um, it just gives you access to more information about the course. And then I also have another webinar that I did about marketing yourself as a sustainable designer, where there's an hour webinar um, and a 30 page workbook on how to do that. And that you can purchase at my uh, shop on my website for $20 Canadian. I'll leave links to this stuff in the chat after. And finally, I'm a huge nerd, so I love talking about this stuff with people. So feel free to email me, feel free to DM me on Instagram. Um, I'm always willing to chat with people. Um, so thank you very, very much for listening to me. And I'm really excited to uh, continue this conversation. And now I'm going to hand it off to Amy. Okay, that was phenomenal, Emma. Um, I do just want to acknowledge there is one question in the chat from Sophie and we will get there. You will not be forgotten about, I promise. Um, when we do the Q&A, that will be the first one we answer. So let me share my screen. Okay, can everybody see my presentation? Is that what's up right now? Yes. Okay, cool. Okay. So um, I'll do a little intro about myself. So I'm Amy, I'm the owner and founder of Blue Raspberry Design. Um, I'm a green graphic and web designer and just overall environmentalist. I think the environment drives like over 90% of the decisions that I make in my life. Um, and so today I'm gonna to do a brief intro to green web design, why it matters, um, some best practices and tips and resources. And what's really cool about uh, designing your website to be more environmentally friendly is that a lot of these tips actually help your um, clients that are going to your website. It can help boost your SEO, it can help your load times and it can just give them an overall better experience. Yeah. So I want to start by addressing a myth that perpetuates in our society um, that the fact that if something's digital, it must be green. Um, and I even felt kind of silly the first time that I Googled green web design because like it's on the cloud. It's not a physical piece of paper. Like it's nothing physical. So it must be green. And that reality came crashing down really hard around me the, when I Googled it. Um, so the, in, the internet itself is really not very clean. Um, there's 
so many things to consider. A lot of people will only talk about like the energy usage when switching from paperless to digital, but it goes so much deeper than that. There's energy used to create the hardware that we used. Um, that hardware only lasts a certain amount of time and to create more, like we have to source these materials. Are they ethically sourced? Um, what damage do we do to the environment when we do that? Um, once they run their life cycle, are they properly recycled? If they are recycled, what does that process look like? Um, if they're not recycled and they end up in a landfill, they have toxins that can leach into groundwater. Um, so it's a huge picture um, with how hardware and energy both interact and they're both part of this picture. Um, but I'm gonna focus more on the energy side uh, for green web design for today. So what? let's look at the, the problem and put it into tangible terms. So data centers are places that house servers where websites live. And these emit 2% of the total carbon um, in the world. And that's as much as the airline industry. Um, so I don't really see anybody out there arguing that the airline industry is super green and um, there's discussions on how to deal with its pollution. So I think that the attention that we're giving to that is something that we should be giving to our digital communities as well with how much these data centers um, pollute. And data centers are actually um, only growing with their problems. Um, by 2040, it's expected that they will make up 14% of the world's carbon emissions, which is as much as the US accounts for today. Um, so the good thing is, is that as designers and developers, we can do something to help solve this problem. Like Emma was saying, this is not going to be the end all be all but every little bit helps. Um, so to start at looking at the problem and how we can help it, um, there's two sides to a website that we need to consider. So there is the server side, which is where your website lives. And then there's the client side, which is the people who are accessing your website. Um, so both sides have hardware and energy. One side being the server side, you can control to an extent of what kind of energy does it run on? Um, are they using energy efficient hardware? Do they properly recycle their materials as a company? Um, but the client side, you have no idea what energy they're using. Um, you have no idea what hardware they're using. You don't even know what device they're looking at it on. Um, they could be using their phone, a tablet, desktop, um, laptop, anything. Um, and I think the way that we approach responsive design in this sense and how that was born of you want to account for as many possibilities as possible. Um, you want to consider the environmental impact of no matter what energy your client's using, you are doing everything you can to lower the carbon footprint of your website when they load it. Um, so Let's start at the server side of everything because that one is much more actionable um, and easier to put into practice. Like literally today, you could go out and do this if you wanted to. Um, so green web hosts are the biggest thing that you should be looking into. And these are um, hosts that use renewable energy or where they can't use renewable energy, they're buying carbon offsets. Um, so these are only three examples. There are many other out, many others out there. Um, these just kind of blew me away with their environmental policies. Um, and web hosts are not a one size fits all. So I wanted to give some options. So Green Geeks is what I use. Um, they are actually 300% green. Whatever carbon they use, they offset it by a multitude of three, which is really cool. And Greenhost is another one, and they run off of 100% wind energy. Um, and then Kualo, which is um, another Greenhost, and, and their website is like really cool. They have this awesome graphic, so I recommend everybody goes and visits there. Um, so those are three options. And what I mean by a web host is not a one size fits all. Um, 
there's a couple different things you want to look for. So the location of your server matters. Um, you want to pick a server location that is close to your clientele. So if you're based in the US, and, but your like major clients are in say like the UK, you want your server to be over there. And this is really, you wanna shorten the distance um, geographically so that the data has like less distance to travel. It will help your load times. And then that in turn means people are spending less time on your website overall, um, which uses less energy, which is overall greener. So Green Geeks has locations in the US, Canada, and the Netherlands. Um, Greenhost is solely in the Netherlands and Amsterdam, which is how they can um, make sure that everything runs off of 100% wind energy. And then Kualo has a primary location in Florida and a secondary location in the UK. Um, and when you sign up for any of these services, you can choose where you want your website to be hosted. Um, and then the other part of web hosting that you want to look at is dedicated versus shared hosting. Um, if you're a web designer or developer and you're hosting many uh, clients' websites, then you probably have a reseller hosting, which is what I have. Um, and basically, you get to host your website and then you get a certain number of other logins um, to host clients' websites, and then you can manage those all from there. But for anybody who's not uh, primarily a web designer or developer, maybe you only have to host your own, you are going to be looking at shared or dedicated hosting. Um, so dedicated hosting means that you get an entire web server all to yourself. Um, it's generally much more expensive and it's a bigger drain on the environment because unless you're an absolutely huge company, you're never gonna use up all the space on one server by yourself. Um, so you wanna opt for shared hosting, which means that they put multiple websites on the same server, which is the most efficient way to uh, use their servers. So just a quick recap of what you wanna look for in a web host to be environmentally friendly is renewable energy, um, carbon offsets where they maybe can't use renewable energy, um, using a location that is close to your clients, and then lastly, um, shared or reseller hosting if you're a web designer. Um, so shifting away to the other half of web design to where the clients are, what you mainly need to be concerned about is the file size of your web pages. Um, so I just want to make a quick clarification because I keep using web page and website interchangeably and it's not accurate. Um, so I just want to be very clear what I'm talking about. A web page is one singular page in your website. So this is your home page or your about page. Um, so then your website is all of these pages put together. And I just want to put that in perspective of how big one page is. And then you have to take that and multiply it by however many pages you have to get the full scope of how big your website is. So over the years, 10 years ago, um, the average web page was less than a megabyte. But things quickly changed um, over six years that more than doubled to 2.3 megabytes. Um, there was a report from Pingdom, which they have some cool uh, tools, and I'll talk about them later. Um, in 2017, the average web page was closer to three megabytes. And today, the average web page may actually be closer to four megabytes. Um, and why this is important is one, if web pages are bigger, you need much more space to host these pages. And it's much more data for your users to download, which can increase load times. That's more time and energy that they're spending on your web page. And this also directly impacts your SEO. Um, Google does use your file sizes uh, when it ranks pages. So this is also important for that side of things as well, not just the environment. Um, and there's a couple of reasons for this rise. Um, I think the uh, huge rise in image-based um, websites, I keep calling it the Squarespace aesthetic. If you 
have any idea what I mean by that. Um, I haven't seen anybody else use that term, but uh, like huge background images, minimal text, like kind of a minimalist, but like full of big, beautiful images. Um, and images really bog down on a site. Um, the other part is JavaScript. Um, that has been used much more prevalent. And I think people are relying on that much more than HTML and CSS nowadays. And lastly, WYSIWYG editors, so Squarespace, Wix, um, those types of platforms, they're really great and they make web building accessible to more people, but because they need to be, um, they need to be able to fit a lot of different types of websites, their code just gets bloated um, because they're trying to be a one size fits all. Um, so to dig into this more, and the good news is, is that even though file sizes are going up, you do not have to make your website the most boring thing ever, like no images, no video, no JavaScript. That's not the case at all. It's just understanding where your file size comes from. Um, so in 2010 and in 2016 and now, um, images make up the hugest portion of your website. And there are a couple ways to fix this. Um, one is to optimize your images for your website. And you can do this in Illustrator and Photoshop. There's just a file save for web um, button and that will compress it. It will give you the option of how big you actually want to save the image at, um, which is it can take a little bit of learning to understand what size you should be saving your images at. Um, a general rule of thumb, I would say, would be any image that is full size for your screen to save at about 2,000 pixels because um, for resolution size, 1980 has overtaken 1024 um, pixels wide. And 4K is on the rise, but it has not overtaken 1980. Um, and that's a whole other conversation if we should be designing for 4K monitors. Um, so 2000 pixels wide should be like the absolute max you should be saving your images at. And then you should be going much smaller if they don't take up the entire screen. Um, scripts, again, like I said, they're on the rise. They really drag on a site. Um, scripts are going to be the code that makes like slideshows work, those little cool fancy animations that happen as you scroll down a page. Um, those bloat sites, fonts are another big one. There are so many web fonts nowadays and people maybe want to make their site super custom, use a lot of different fonts. Um, but each font style you load is actually a chunk of it. So like if you're using Open Sans, if you're using Open Sans regular, that's a different font that needs to be loaded than just Open Sans bold or Open Sans italic. Like those are three separate fonts that you're loading. You're not just loading the family and then you have use of all the styles. They're all completely separate. So minimizing the use of those. Um, and then video has actually grown um, from that report that Pingdom had put out. Video is a much bigger portion now. Um, and it's like those really awesome full screen autoplay videos that are on websites that look really, really awesome. Those really take up a big chunk of your file. And I'm not saying get rid of everything, simplify everything down. I think it's just being conscious and asking yourself, do I really need this? Or is simplifying my site more important to me? Um, and just understanding your role. So. With all of that said, you might be thinking, okay, well, how the heck do I check out my website? How do I see where I need to improve? I have some awesome tools for you. Um, I'm really excited about these. Um, so Pingdom, which is a website that I've been referencing throughout this, um, they have a tool. If you go to that URL, you can put in a web page URL and it will give you a really awesome snapshot of how big is this web page. It will add together all the code, HTML, CSS, um, all of your images, videos, all of your assets, and give you a really great snapshot. Um, and then it will also give you detailed information. And um, I want to do like a quick shout out to Google PageSpeed Insights with this as well. I use both of these in tandem. Um, I think Kingdom is really, really great at giving the snapshot. But for me, I just prefer how Google puts out the image or the 
information on the breakdown of your actual site and file size. Um, so I use both of those in tandem to check out file sizes. And the biggest part of um, most sites, again, is images. And Google does kind of tell you, OK, you can optimize this image and cut off this amount of storage space. Um, my absolute favorite tool is the website carbon calculator. This is so awesome. I think I just check websites on this for fun. Um, it will tell you how clean or dirty a website is in comparison to all the other websites that they've checked. Um, so it'll put it in percentages. And then it will tell you um, the amount of carbon that your web page produces when people go to it. And it also will take that number and put it into tangible items. So like a gram of carbon doesn't mean anything to me. I don't know what that means. Um, but it will tell you like for every 10,000 page views, um, your site produces enough carbon that five trees can absorb it. And I think that's a really awesome way to put the information. Um, and then lastly, so website carbon calculator actually uses the Green Web Foundation database to tell you if a site runs on renewable energy or if it runs on standard um, energy. And even though website carbon calculator tells you that, I still like using the Green Web Foundation by itself um, because it also tells you who hosts the site. And through there, I've found other renewable energy um, hosts. And that's actually how I discovered Google runs on renewable energy as well for their web hosting, which is pretty cool. Um, so yeah, that was like a super uh, <laughs> crash course into green web design. Um, I do have a course in the works and coming. Um, you can sign up to the waitlist if you would like. Um, I'm in the very beginning stages of it, I'm going to be honest. Um, so it'll be a few months before it is launched, but if you want to be the first to know, um, definitely sign up, no obligation, and I'll throw this URL in the chat. Um, but otherwise, like Emma, I'm a nerd. I love talking about this stuff. Um, so it's shoot me a message on Instagram, just at Blue Raspberry Design, or you can email me. Um, yeah, thanks, guys. Awesome. Okay, you should totally put the the link to your course in the chat though, because there was a little um, pop up right over the. Link. Oh, <laughs> it was it was over my link too. I realized now. No. Um, but yeah, you should totally paste your okay. links in the chat so people can people can get to them. Um, yeah. So should we do our discussion first? Or um, the questions. We can do maybe questions just to make sure we get through all of them. OK, yeah, okay. for sure. Oh, and also quick thing, because I did have my sources on my slides, but the little bar might have like covered those. So if you want my sources, <laughs> um, let me know. <laughs> and I we can send out the slides in the email. Oh, OK, perfect. Yeah. Yeah. Um, OK, so Sophie asked, how do we verify these companies and their dumping habits? So the easiest way that I found to do that is actually just to um, Google company and then pollution or uh, violation or environmental protection act or any kind of keyword that you're potentially looking for in terms of uh, specific environmental uh, um, black marks, you could say. Um, usually it's going to return up with Domtar. It came up with a lot of like actual EPA government documents, um, a lot of documents from the Ontario government here as well, because Domtar is uh, international. So I found violations both in Canada and the US. And so I was actually able to track down like the actual court documents uh, for their violations and how those violations were handled. So it basically just is a little bit of creative Googling, um, checking um, so you could even run the company and then uh, look at forestry or uh, logging practices or um, any kind of like fines or violations are really like good keywords. Um, I'm gonna suggest that you stay away from looking at annual reports for companies and go to more uh, independent journalism watchdog sites because annual reports produced by the companies are going to be putting forward a positive spin on whatever they're doing because they want to look really good. So for example, with Domtar, the uh, Superfund $2 million site uh, that they had to clean up that I mentioned earlier, they list that site in their annual report and they say that it's an environmental champion because they've done so much cleanup there. Um, but like they don't mention why they had to clean up or why it was bad and why there's been such a difference. 
um, and why they were actually legislated to clean that up by the government, um, which is really great. Um, so basically, uh, that was a violation that happened around 2008 or nine, I believe, and they do sort of like five year check ins. Um, so there was a five year check in in 2015 about the progression of the site and they had it mostly better, but there were still some particular areas that they were failing on in terms of the government regulate government regulation for what they were supposed to be doing. Sorry, everyone. Um, and then 2020 is the year there's supposed to be another uh, check in for that site, although um, who knows if that's actually going to happen with the state of the EPA right now. Um, so yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Um, definitely just consider your sources uh, where you're getting uh, the, the information from. Be wary of anything that's produced by the actual company themselves and always look to uh, check their claims elsewhere. I believe okay. that was my only question. So Amy, it's all you know. Okay, yeah, okay. So um, Alicia asked when web platforms like Webflow or Squarespace have hosting built in, what is the suggested tip to do there? So that is a little bit of a sticky situation because yes, you are 100% locked in to their hosting. Um, and I know a lot of people do really love Squarespace um, with how user friendly it is. and. Um, I did reach out to Squarespace and I emailed their customer service and asked them if they have any plans to do renewable energy servers or other sustainability um, practices that they have. And they attempted to get me more information on their servers, which they could not provide to me. So I really don't have any information for what they actually use, but I know that it's not renewable. They did not say that they had any intentions to move that direction, um, which is disappointing because they have the opportunity to really be a leader in this when they host over 2 million websites. Um, so I think the best thing that you can do there is to really just optimize your images, optimize the number of fonts that you use, um, and focus on the content and the things that you can control. Um, and then if, you know, we can all only do so much. Squarespace has way more power to change things. Um, so one thing that I am in the works of doing, I don't have like a sign up for anything yet, um, but I, I do want to kind of amass an army of people where, you know, how people email their representatives about issues. What if we all collectively email Squarespace and are like, please be green, please use renewable energy, or I will switch away from you. Um, because I know Wix, when they don't own their actual servers, I reached out to their customer service too, um, but they use some Google servers to host their sites. So I don't know if that's a choice that you can make, but that gives you the option for renewable energy. Um, and I was Googling if there is a way to take your Squarespace site and like just save it out and then like host it elsewhere. There was, I guess, a WordPress plugin, which maybe is an opportunity to do that, but I don't know enough about it, um, but I can do more digging. So. There are probably options out there. Yeah. Um, so next question, um, any tips on optimizing video for web for businesses that are video heavy? <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. I personally don't have a ton of experience um, with videos. I think the, the main video optimization that I've done was um, like walkthroughs on websites that I had on my portfolio for a little while but that was so long ago that I honestly don't remember what I did. Um, so that's something that I can follow up on, um, do some research because I, I just, I don't have the knowledge on it. Um, I'm, because I don't think there is an option in, in places to like save for web in a sense like you do with images. Um, so it might just be choosing a lower resolution for your video. Um, there are when i was looking into 4k there were people that suggested shoot your videos in 4k upload them in 4k to your website and i think that's crazy um so yeah so definitely i think keeping it lower res um or yeah i'm not 100 percent sure on that but i can look into that um so optimizing a one size fits all web design to be greener um yeah that kind of leads back into what i was talking about with squarespace of trying to control your own content of optimizing your images, using less fonts, um, using less scripts and, and stuff like that. Um, any more that's looking here? 
Oh, is there a list of good companies to work with design wise? No, but we should make it. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Um, I think we should for sure come up with a list and especially um, with how easy it is to contact companies nowadays and get answers from their customer service. Like that's totally a resource page that could be made of like, I asked this question, this is what they told me. Is this good enough for your own standards? Yes or no? <laughs> um, and then decide from there if you want to work with them. Um, yeah. So, did I miss anything? Okay. Yes, yeah, so some good comments. Yeah, Video Nerd, um, Emma, got that. <laughs> 720 or 1080p yeah um, yeah I I do have a question for Emma actually um I wrote this down during your presentation so you talked about plant-based inks um yes and so obviously working local is also good is it better in in your opinion I guess maybe there's a lot of variables here but um to Pick a place that's further away so that printed materials have to be transported to you, but they use plant-based inks or use a local printer, even if they use petroleum-based inks? Local printer, even if they use petroleum-based inks. Okay. Um, obviously, it, this, this goes back to the questions of harm. So basically, um, I think that because um, in terms of printed materials, paper, the paper choice is the more important material that's potentially causing the most harm in terms of uh, quantity of material because the inks are really only going on a portion of the paper, but you need a certain amount of paper to complete whatever project. So this also depends on scale of printing. So um, if you are, if you live in a town where there's not really like a lot of eco-friendly printers or recycled paper options, and you have a really big client that really needs like 10,000, 20,000 of a print run of something, um, that point where potentially it might be a lower carbon option to use a printer further away because they have uh, more capabilities to do a higher print run with more environmentally friendly products and more environmentally friendly processes um, that just due to the sheer quantity, it's worth the transport cost because you have so much paper being printed. Um, so these are sort of questions that um, vary between each individual project and something to consider as well is that local should usually be a local to the client um, which may mean if you want this is optional of course but doing more research in terms of where the client is based and what kind of options they have available to them to limit the transport to them um, because usually well i guess some designers ship to themselves first but um, depending on the thing usually uh, it just goes directly to the client so um, it really depends on the scale of project that you're working on if it's something small like you know maybe only like a thousand pieces uh, definitely I would serve um, plant-based inks. Uh, the thing about plant-based inks too is that while they're a good step forward, um, there's a little bit of greenwashing in terms of their creation. And so when something is plant-based or soy-based, um, there's actually no regulation for what level of majority that has to be in terms of the ink formula and what level of petroleum product is still remaining. So basically something could be 5% soy-based and it can be still uh, claimed as being soy-based inks. So that's just something to keep aware of. Um, you can always email printers and ask more information um, because there's not a lot of information about all of this stuff. Sometimes it is just trial and error with every single project. And something I really want to uh, put forward to you guys is that I know that my presentation was kind of intense for all these things that can go wrong in terms of design and the, the, the role that we have, but it's okay to not have every project turn out right. It's okay to not have a client understand something. It's okay to not make 100% of the best choice. As long as you are you know, trying your best and trying to make the best choices you can in the situation that you're in, that's totally okay. Like we are all, you know, in different places financially and in terms of client inquiries and even just the kinds of clients that we're working with. And so, you know, it's not like if you can't be 100% green with every single project you do that you failed. So that's just something I really want to, to make clear because it's more important that we're just doing our best and trying to make as many small changes as we can to move towards a greener future than it is to have it be all or nothing. Um, and it looks like we got another question. Oh. Um, how do you usually approach clients in terms of educating them towards trying to choose greener alternatives for their projects? Oh. So 
Um, usually this just is more of a one-on-one -on -one conversation that I have with clients. Um, right away when people book with me, um, even from the first inquiry call before they've signed, I'm very upfront with my green printing policies because I have decided um, I have decided to implement um, basically the most green policies that I can um, and force my clients to adhere to those. Uh, so that's a personal um, a personal uh, decision that I've done with my business. Uh, so I'm very upfront with them from the beginning. But then when it comes down to individual uh, print, print, uh, print pieces and the sort of materials that it's on, we have a discussion about what is best for their, uh, for their business and for the thing that they're trying to achieve. So maybe they wanted rack cards to go out to every single person in the city um, via mail before, but maybe the best choice for them is actually to print 200 and deliver them to individual businesses that will actually uh, solicit business to them instead of just sort of like spamming everyone in the mail um, and then having most of those go into trash or recycling. Um, so it really becomes a question of what are the client's goals? What are they trying to achieve in terms of packaging? What are they actually packaging up? What sort of specifications does it have? Does it need bubble wrap or something to keep it safe? That kind of thing. Um, so it's really just like a one-on-one -on -one conversation when we get to the designing the materials about the impact of each thing and about my recommendations for the best way to proceed. Yeah. Also, um, I have found that if a client is being obstinate, sometimes they just need to be told straight up what the problem is and why it's bad. Because I have a lot of clients that really want plastic laminate, soft touch coatings on their business cards because they think it feels velvety and it's oh so nice. But then when I tell them that it's actually a single use plastic and their card can't be recycled and it breaks down into microplastics and that's bad for X, Y, Z reason, they're like, oh my God, I didn't know. <laughs> oh, and they, they change. So a lot of the time it's really just about letting them know because not everyone is on the same uh, level of uh, research and uh, knowledge as you. So sometimes it's just informing them <laughs> that that's not a good choice. Um, I also kind of want to add to to that. Um, like, I think being upfront with them too, and I think that a lot of times people conflate eco friendly with, oh my gosh, this is going to cost me so much more. And like, unless you're using the cheapest paper that exists out there, which you're probably not using anyway for your business cards, um, recycled paper is very much on par with um, mm -hmm. traditionally made paper for cost. Um, so Absolutely. it's not as big. And even like if somebody wants to splurge for a soft touch or a golden metallic, but like they think, you know, just because it's flashy, it's like, okay, well, maybe look at these alternatives like embossing, like, yeah, that's expensive, but so is the gold foil. And one has less of an expensive impact on the planet. Um, putting in those terms. Yeah, there's like so many cool ways to make something luxury um, without it actually uh, hurting the environment. So like the embossing, um, really cool like die cut papers and stuff. All of these things can really like lend to a luxury high end feel that actually looks way cooler than just like some foiling on something. Um, because while that's flashy and stuff, um, you can bring in a level of sophistication to the design with more of these old school techniques um, that have stood the test of time, especially letterpress. Um, okay, then another question, can you share your favorite examples of green design or web design practices? Um, so I think, I mean, we touched on this a little bit, but I think part of my favorite part of green design is that it opens you up to so many interesting looking paper stocks. And then the paper becomes a part of the design and it's such like, it does so much of the heavy lifting for you almost in the design and it's just beautiful. Um, and then I'm going to share a link in the chat of this awesome website that Emma actually sh shared with me, but it's a um, clothing store that sells basics. And so they have this um, low impact version of their site where they don't even have like photos of the clothing that they sell. It's just line drawings. And it's just like this awesome thing to look at and like think about um, like, do we actually need to see a photo of this basic sock that I'm buying or is the line drawing enough? So I think it's just so cool. I would really recommend playing around with it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd probably uh, agree with Amy in terms of the paper stocks because there's so many incredible options that have those amazing textures and looks and um, like it, they just look so authentic and unique and they're 
they're, uh, you know, not as just like bleach pure white. Um, I really think that, you know, environmentally friendly papers, some of them just like look like regular paper, don't get me wrong. Some of them look like you can't tell the difference, but some of them are just like so unique that they bring such character to the, um, especially Mohawk's renewal line of papers. Um, they really, um, you know, there's a hemp paper, there's a recycled cotton paper made out of jeans, and there's a, a straw, reclaimed straw paper. And they're just, they have these incredibly rich colors. Um, it's so beautiful and you can see the fibering through the stock and it's just absolutely stunning. I can't wait to use them in a packaging project, but like these kinds of things, not only are they super environmentally friendly, but they're just beautiful. And so like, I think that a really important thing is that just because something's green doesn't mean it has to be ugly or sustainable looking or craft if you don't want the craft aesthetic and so i think there's just so much opportunity for exploration in terms of design projects to really push uh what's normal for for paper stocks and, and design applications um and then a couple of people asked for the google tool that i had mentioned in my presentation i just dropped the link in the chat it was google page speed insights um so that is there now too awesome does anyone else have any questions? I guess people have been, you know, very diligently writing them in the chat. Thank you so much. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I think we're pretty much at our time now. Um, Amy, is there anything else you want to add? Um, I'm putting you on the spot, but. Yeah, I know. I think we like hit a lot of really good topics. So, I mean, yeah, I think this was great really awesome questions loved this discussion um this was super awesome and i mean if you have any other questions feel free to message either of us um because mm -hmm. i mean there's so many topics to cover yeah please feel free to to carry on this conversation with us you know outside of this webinar we're going to have more uh of these kinds of things available because we're both super excited about this kinds of research are coming. It's so awesome to have so many people sign up and so many actually attend in person. So thank you so much to everyone.